What's up, YouTube? Welcome to the heavily requested run of God of War Ragnarok. I have had so many people in comments on TikTok, YouTube, and otherwise ask me to play this game and to play 2018. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this run. This is going to be like one of my traditional Let's Plays where we use this game to illustrate psychological concepts, to talk about relationships and mental health. So something that uh, people wonder is, why do I not do everything? Why do I make certain decisions that I make? I just want to make sure that everybody remembers that when I do these game playthroughs, the reason I'm doing them is to illustrate concepts and to educate folks that is the primary purpose for why i do this do i try to be entertaining while i do it absolutely but these are educational first and foremost and i appreciate those of you that ask questions in the comments and elaborate on certain things that i say or share your own experiences and i definitely encourage you throughout the playthrough to leave comments and to like all of the streams and ask follow-up questions on stuff that i talk about i realize that it's on youtube so it's going to be in the future but I will respond to whatever comments that I can. I do ask that you please not post any spoilers or do any backseating of any kind because if people are watching the playthrough and maybe it's blind for them, spoiling it's kind of lame. So if you do that, I'm going to remove your comments. I am not going to play God of War 2018. I'm going to talk about why after we do the recap. And um, yeah, this is just, this is going to be a really good run. I'm really grateful for all of your support. I certainly encourage you to check out all my other playthroughs on the channel, and I hope that you will hang in with this run until the end. So much love to you and enjoy. Here we go, let's watch the recap. The boy's mother is dead. She wanted us to spread her ashes on the highest peak in all the realms. The gods of these realms don't take kindly to outsiders, trust me. You are God. Leader of the Vanir, once yes, but no longer. There's only one person alive who can get you where you need to go. First, you need to cut off my head. Odin's eye is on you, brother. Especially now that you've taken to killing his kin. When I came to these shores, I chose to live as a man. But the truth is, I was born a god, and so were you. We can do whatever we want. There are consequences to killing a god! Mother. No, back off, Kratos. This has nothing to do... No! No, 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 my boy! My dear sweet boy! It's Muller. Look, she was a giant. I'm a giant. I guess there's just one thing I don't understand. The giants called me... Loki? A question for another day. <laughs> All right. So... Wow, that seems super juicy, Dr. Mick. Why aren't you gonna play 2018, you ask? As I have traditionally said to folks about God of War 2018, it's that the game would be about 95% me solving puzzles and about 5% me giving the same analysis over and over. The primary driver of God of War 2018 is Kratos and Atreus going through a ritual slash process related to grief at the loss of Atreus's mother. And one of the things that we learned throughout 2018 is that Kratos is not particularly adept at exhibiting emotion or responding to emotion. Kratos spends his life mostly killing people and gods 
and generally does it alone. And one of the things that he exhibits throughout 2018 is that anger is about the only way that he can access emotion, which is not entirely uncommon. One of the reasons that people actually will go to anger um, is because anger is relatively easy to express and particularly for men in the binary society we tend to live in. Um, I acknowledge that there are non-binary folks that might go to anger as well, but we tend to attribute this to men because we, we see anger as something that fits emotionally within the parameter of masculinity. And Kratos, for all intents and purposes, exhibits just about every stereotypical masculine trait that there is. So anger is a secondary emotion that veils a lot of the more tender emotions. And my sense is that Kratos has never really had the opportunity, nor has he ever learned how to express anything that's underneath that anger. It's not that he doesn't feel it. I'm sure that he feels sadness and confusion and disappointment. But for him to share that and to acknowledge it for himself, let alone put it out into the world, I'm not sure that he has ever had an experience, maybe outside of Atreus's mother, we never get to see his relationship with her, where that kind of emotion is held and accepted and validated. So Atreus in 2018 is a bit of a foil to that, where Atreus being a developing child is has not learned to veil that emotion he's not learned that he has to stuff it he hasn't learned that that can be dangerous to show emotional vulnerability because he has a mandate and directive as an up-and-coming god so he as we would expect developmentally throughout the game will ask kratos questions he will acknowledge things like sadness he will show curiosity about certain emotional aspects of their journey that kratos just kind of broods over and kratos's general response to atreus when he does that is to either shut it down or just further brood it's not necessarily because Kratos doesn't know what Atreus is saying. It's because if Kratos connects with the emotional experience of Atreus and really gets in there, acknowledges it, softens, he has to do that for himself. And because he hasn't really learned to do that for himself and because he might perceive that to be dangerous to do, he tends to wall himself off to Atreus and subject him to more traditionally masculine and stoic ways of orienting himself toward grief and toward emotion. He does that by being very short, like single words. He does that by getting him to focus on the behavioral tasks at hand. Do this, do that, we need to solve this. He tends to get him to be very goal-oriented, much to Atreus's chagrin. One of the things that Atreus kind of learns throughout God of War 2018 is that Kratos is not accessible, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's because Kratos doesn't connect with that deeper emotional experience. So what you would hear me saying over and over in 2018 is, this is an attempt of Atreus to connect with his father over an emotional experience he's having, and this is Kratos' inability to go there. And it would just be that over and over and over and over and over again. So Atreus gets a little bit of that emotional validation from Freya in the story and from some of the other characters, which he tends to gravitate toward. But we see Kratos have a bit of a standoffish vibe with that because at the end of the day, Kratos feels an immense sense of protection over Atreus. He sees his role as being somebody who has to cultivate his son to be a god and to be somebody who is functional to the world that he lives in and so he will override a lot of the nuance of what that relationship could be by going into that more black and white directive to be fair to 2018 that's very well done like that dynamic is very well done it's realistic i think people can connect 
in a lot of ways with like Atreus in particular um, and what it's like to be around somebody who tends to be more brooding and closed off. But there's a humanity to Kratos that I think a lot of people get frustrated with him because it feels inaccessible. And we think that we should be able to access that. And the reality is that it's not necessarily that Kratos is intentionally withholding. It is in a lot of ways because Kratos simply has not learned how to bring himself to relationships and to the world in that way. Um, Mimir was okay. I, I don't, I don't have as much of a recollection of Mimir to really go deep into an analysis on Mimir. I think Mimir is an interesting character in so far as he through like humor and quips tries to open Kratos up. See, the, the thing that's really interesting about it is like everybody around Kratos is very aware that Kratos is not accessible. And some people tend to make light of that. Some people tend to poke at it. Some people tend to, they'll, they'll try to crack it open, but everybody around Kratos understands that he is closed off. But for me, yeah, Mimir was more of a device to move the plot along rather than anything else. And I think we saw a little bit of a... We saw grief, obviously, between Freya and Balder when we... Especially when we killed Balder. There's a lot in there um, that, like, I'm not going to recap the entire game. But I want to give just a little bit of a background in terms of, like, where Kratos and Atreus were and where I'm sure we're going to enter this game at, which is that... Atreus was developing and trying to create some sort of meaning and engage with his emotional experience around the loss of his mother and the ritual of taking her ashes up the mountain. And Kratos was doing that in his own way, but what we're seeing is a person who is more close to a blank slate in Atreus and a person who has had a lifetime of experiences that have shaped his orientation to emotion in Kratos. And I have to believe that as Kratos and Atreus spend more time together, particularly here through Ragnarok, we're going to see maybe a bit of an opening up from Kratos and maybe a bit of a hardening of Atreus. And I'm also interested to see some of the other characters and relationship dynamics that are present in this game. Because 2018 focuses really mostly on Kratos, Atreus, Freya to an extent, a little bit of Balder. And that's really it. Um, a lot of the other characters are just kind of like fun side characters. It's a wonderful game. It's a beautiful game. I played it. I beat all the Valkyries. I did everything you could do could do in the game. It just doesn't have the depth and the amount of content that I thought it was worthy of bringing to a playthrough on this. Ragnarok is different. So that's my recap analysis uh, as it relates to uh, 2018. And I hope that that makes sense and kind of gives you a little bit of a template through which I'm going to be thinking about Ragnarok. Um, but there's a lot of slim pickings in that game. I think in part also because the 2018 created a huge shift in the franchise because the original Gods of War were very much like hack and slash and a lot of enemies. I know there was exposition. I know there was a little bit about Kratos in there. But I think a lot of people see 2018 as having so much depth because Sony Santa Monica completely changed the way that people play God of War and changed the representation of Kratos in that. And so I think people are like, whoa, this is so deep and amazing. And it is in its own way, but it's a lot of the same beats over and over and over again. And you'd get tired of hearing me say the same thing over and over and over again. And I would get tired of saying the same thing over and over you think Kratos opened up at all emotionally during the first game? I do. We did see a bit of a progression over the course of the game. Kratos, I think, started to realize in a few instances that Atreus was not as hardened as he was. And again, I think there's probably some small part of Kratos that wishes that he could access things in the way that Atreus does. But he's got a lot of experiential history that comes in and blocks him from doing that. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of character development for Kratos in terms of emotion available to him. It comes down to, does he really want to grab the bull by the horns and ask himself, do I need to continue to orient myself to the world in the way that I have based on how long I've been in it? Because K Kratos is old. He's really old. So he's had these patterns locked in for longer than any of our lifetimes. 
And I think that's another thing that's really important to remember. Kratos isn't just some 30 year old dude. So he has a, he has a multiple lifetimes worth of, uh, these patterns being reinforced, which is really speaks to the nurture aspect of how we tend to, I keep saying orient ourselves to the environment, but the way that we orient ourselves to ourselves, to others, to the environment, to context, to perceptions is loaded on how that environment responds to what we put into it and what we take away from it. And we can't really escape that. Kratos's life has dictated that he needs to be a brooding and stoic and powerful person because he has to, he has to kill other gods. He has to get the job done at any cost. He has to protect people. And I'm guessing he never really learned that vulnerability and emotional availability has a place in that. So. Yeah, Kratos is a spark. So that's the recap. Those of you, I, I maybe will make this into some kind of short for YouTube. So if we do... Uh, I hope that that explains a little bit about why I'm not going to do 2018. Just remember, I love the game. It was fantastic, but you won't see it on the play on the, on any of these playthroughs. I got a lot of other games that I want to do, but I am excited to do Ragnarok and I'm looking forward to catching you here in part one as we go through it. Part one of gate of God of war Ragnarok with a therapist starts now. Thank you for being here. Like the video, leave a comment. Tell people about it. Engage with me on TikTok. Follow the links in the description. Let's rock and roll. Hungry? We're going to start right off the bat here. Right off the bat. Because this is what we do. We overanalyze. Kratos is not a man of verbal affirmation. Never has been. Maybe he will be. But Kratos is not a person that shows affection very well via verbiage. He's an access, act of service kind of guy. That's what his whole entire life is built around. So Atreus, in some ways, has learned that from Kratos because the first thing we see from him walking in here is that he caught a deer and he's, eat, and he's bringing food and asking his dad if he's hungry. So there's an act of service. So that's sort of an acknowledgement of the way that Kratos shows love. And Kratos responds to that by handing Atreus arrows. Kratos doesn't use a bow. So he did that specifically to take care of Atreus. And there's an acknowledgement there in the way that he hands it to him and the way that he makes eye contact. 
over Atreus's life, he has very likely learned that Kratos doing that for him is the way that he shows that he cares. And it's an acknowledgement of Atreus as being somebody who uses a bow. He didn't press on to Atreus that he needs to use an axe and glaives and all that stuff. But I think the concept that's most important to talk about here is that people have different ways of giving and receiving affection and acknowledgement, validation, and love. If you can learn the ways that people show it and receive it, you are going to level up in your relationships and in the ways that you show affection because it will allow you to see certain gestures as an act of love and it also can allow you to reach people in a way that's going to be meaningful to them instead of using what works for you, which may not work for them. And in this very opening scene, we see a really cool example of that between Atreus and Kratos. What's next? Who? Oh. The storm is getting worse. I'll get them ready. Need help? <laughs> Good try. Kratos is never going to say yes. He's never going to say yes unless it's an emergency. <laughs> I, I just, I just, I love it because like... <laughs> as old as Kratos is... <laughs> And the role that he takes on as being somebody who takes care of. Atreus already outdid himself by bringing the deer. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that Kratos is really only open to help when it's on his terms. Because he feels like he's giving somebody a sense of purpose. As opposed to having somebody passively suggest that maybe he's somebody who needs help. I know it's a really small thing, but part of the reason that I pause on this moment is because a lot of caregivers, and I think you're going to hear me say this a lot through the playthrough, a lot of caregivers do not open themselves up to being taken care of because they view that as some sort of suggestion that they're not capable of helping others. And oftentimes, the thing that people who are taken care of want for the people that take care of them is for them to use that amazing caregiving ability on themselves and to also ask for help or acknowledge that they need help if they do. Now, it may be that Kratos doesn't need help. It, like, it may be like, this is a trivial thing, boy, and I'm perfectly capable of doing this and I don't need you to ask it. But that also doesn't mean that Kratos isn't registering that Atreus is attuned to the fact that he is doing something and may need assistance and that that is something that Atreus is open to doing. So there's a lot of layers to that little grunt there beyond Kratos just being a brooding, you know, bleh. And it's funny that, that Atreus continues to ask knowing that it's most likely that Kratos isn't going to say anything. Think of it as like putting little coins in the bank of I'm willing to help, I'm willing to help, I'm willing to help. Even if you say no, the suggestion is there. Ooh, what is that? Ready? 
already. Potentially Skag. Now, both of them are very obviously still grieving, given the fact that uh, they're each carrying a little memento. And this is cool as hell. Holy shit. Dog sledding? You kidding me? I hope Fenrir got some sleep. Maybe he'll be ready to eat when we get home. He is quite sick, Atreus. I know, but he was a little better yesterday. Until he wasn't. If he keeps eating, I'm not giving up on him. This is badass. Hear that? Yes. Is it her? It is her. The state is not far. Okay. Get ready. Falcon! Oh boy, Freya's pissed, huh? She wouldn't give up that easy, would she? She never does. Stay alert. Ah, uh, okay. So, for, I mean, it would make sense. Uh, we killed Freya's son, no matter how much of a shitbag he was. Got you. We gotta get away from her. I'm trying. Up there, what's she? Look out! Holy shit, coming in hot. Oh god. That was too close. Coming around again. I do not wish to fight you. I'm losing my grip here. Oh, father! I have you. Hold tight. The protection stave is near. Little tiny bit here. The last time that we saw Freya was when we killed Balder in 2018. We killed her son. And Kratos saying that he doesn't want to fight her is very interesting to me because she keeps attacking and Kratos could probably take her out pretty easily. And his acknowledgement openly that he does not want to fight her, I think in some part may come from a place of empathy of understanding loss and understanding the desire to do something about it and to find something to pin that on. The reality is a big reason why Balder is dead and was killed by us is because Balder was a dick. But for a lot of people, loved ones of like Balder, in this case, his mother, it is very difficult for her to acknowledge that. It's a lot easier to place blame on proxy and stay in touch with our idealizations of the person who's gone rather than acknowledge the reality that like her son was a douche and he invited that in. And she's probably going to continue to attack us and also probably going to in some ways prolong her grief if she continues to see us as the reason why her, her son is dead. We are the reason her son is dead, but not entirely. And her misacknowledgement of the reality is going to potentially hurt her here and it's clearly gonna cause a lot of issues for us. Oh no! Freya, we're not your enemy! Freya, what? Oh. Oh. Holy shit. Please don't make me do this! Oh, 
Even Atreus doesn't want to do it. Dave, we made it. Let us go home. It's Becky. It's Vanna. Up. <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't take the shot. I did not wish you to. I keep hoping she'll let it go. You saved her life. I killed her son. There is no letting that go. Yeah. Which, if Atreus pays attention there, is not just Kratos empathizing with Freya, it's Kratos making an acknowledgement of how much Atreus means to him. See, in order to really get in on Kratos, you have got to read between the lines and pay very close attention to the things that he says. Because in saying to Atreus, we killed her son, and there's no letting that go. What he's saying is, if she killed you, I'd do the same thing. I care as much about you as she cared about Balder. And I totally understand where she's coming from. I didn't want you to kill her because I completely understand what that would be like if you were taken from me. And there were multiple times several years ago where you were. So... Kratos passively here is showing Atreus the nature of his orientation to him as his father, as his caregiver, and as somebody who understands loss and a lot of it, and has been the person who has dealt out a lot of loss. I think also in some ways his softness and connection with Freya's plight here is because he has experienced some dissonance around the fact that he has killed countless people and gods. I will also say that just because Freya is grieving as strongly as she is does not justify her actions. When you channel grief into harming others, that is in, it is inappropriate. You don't get a pass on being an asshole to people and harming them because you're grieving. And sometimes people will hide behind grief as a way to justify those things, and that's not okay. Baldur's gone. Ain't nothing we're going to do to bring him back. Baldur is gone. She has to acknowledge that. And if she doesn't, she's going to keep doing this. It's going to be brutal. I guess killing Balder really did bring on Fimblewinter. It never stopped snowing after that day. Oh. You think it's ever gonna get better? Mm, someday. But the worst Wait. is still ahead of us. We must be strong. I got it. I will get the deer. <laughs> I mean, I love this because there's already so much here to do, okay? Uh, <laughs> Part one of these types of playthroughs is super important because it sets the template for a lot of the analysis that you're going to hear me expand upon later in the game, okay? 
So Atreus now is moving into his teenage years, which means that he is progressively becoming more autonomous and self-sufficient. Most parents, when their children start to get into their teenage years and play around with that autonomy, experience a huge amount of dissonance and struggle with that. The reason being is because Kratos simultaneously wants two things that don't align. Kratos wants to make sure that Atreus is okay and take care of him. Make sure that all is good, all is well, he's safe. But he also wants Atreus to be a badass. He wants Atreus to be self-sufficient and capable. As evidenced by him getting frustrated at times when Atreus was not in 2018. But those don't square up. The more self-sufficient and capable Atreus is, the less necessary Kratos is. Which immediately impacts his role relative to Atreus. So now, as Kratos turns and sees Atreus handle the dogs, handle the deer, and then he's standing there like, I don't know what to do with my hands. That's a real experience that a lot of parents have. And a lot of parents in those moments will try to go back to what they're used to, which is to overdo it on the caretaking front and find certain ways to take care of their kids that they really don't need to do rather than really immersing themselves and being proud of themselves for raising somebody who's becoming increasingly autonomous. So we're going to be watching as Kratos' role and sense of who he is relative to his son changes as his son becomes more capable. And are there times that Atreus maybe acts helpless as a way to give his father something to do because he feels bad about that? a really tough space for a lot of parents to occupy and that little exchange there with Kratos I think kind of lays the foundation that that's where he's at right now so parents be mindful of that be mindful of the facilitation of the autonomy of your kids as they become teenagers Let's see. Jinx, thank you for the raid. I appreciate that. All right. Well. Let's see what kind of cool stuff is over here. By the way, this is just a quick little uh, message to the folks that are here on Twitch with me. If you get ads while you're watching this stream, if you mention that in the comments, it's going to be removed. Uh, it's honestly kind of annoying when people write that in chat. Um, ads are a part of this. It's unfortunate. If you want to get rid of abs, ads, I encourage you to either subscribe to the channel or become a Twitch Turbo member. But messages about ads are annoying and will be removed. And if you do it a lot, you may be timed out or even banned. So just as a heads up. It's a part of the Twitch ecosystem. I wish it wasn't. I don't hear him. He always says hello. Atreus. Fenrir. You okay, boy? Where are you, Fenrir? Oh, we're back at our cottage. Okay. I remember this from the previous game. Oh, boy. It's okay, boy. You're okay. I know. I missed you, too. Where's your food? Still hungry? Come on, boy. You need to eat. Eat. Why? Too big? Boy. Atreus, the time draws. 
was near. You must prepare yourself. For what? He's still eating. He wants to live. He is dying. You're a good boy. A brave boy. Fast and strong. But you can rest now. Okay? I'll be okay. You can let go now. You have to let go. Sofna. Afra. Besu. Sofna. Hethon. Sofna. The eyes. Oh, man. Sofna. Sofna. Train. What? No. It's the middle of the night. Night does not stop our enemies. Why? What for? Training is all we ever do, ever. It's not enough. We can't hide forever. We do not hide. We prepare for a fight for which we are not ready. Oh, go. Time is running out. The prophecies say Fimblewinter leads to Ragnarok. War is coming. Whatever Loki's supposed to be doing, he's supposed to be doing it now. My story doesn't end hiding in these woods. I should be out there, finding out who I am, who Loki is. I will not allow you to pick a fight with gods. I don't want to fight anyone. I just want answers. And if those answers lead to war with Asgard? Well, maybe that's what Mother wanted. We do not know what Mother wanted. Looks like we never will. Well, mixed bag there from from Kratos. Something that we will see from Atreus is a bit of a, I think, a stable developmental trajectory. We're going to see Kratos oscillate a lot. I think Kratos did a really nice job before Fenrir died of acknowledging to Atreus that it was time. As we talked about in other playthroughs, the acknowledgement of death is important. A lot of people hide from it. They, they skirt it. They deny it. Kratos really, in his own way, relative to how he generally is, I think softened really well there. And was... Gave Atreus tough... Excuse me, tough love. Which is, this sucks and it's time. That's reality. 
You can acknowledgement of reality is not antithetical to acknowledging vulnerability and the sadness that comes along with that. So, uh, so Kratos scaffolding Atreus into that moment in the way that he did, I think is cool. So that's the first part. The second part here is how it is how Kratos responded after. When Kratos sees Atreus experience emotion, which we saw overtly, we saw tears. He's crying. He's softening. He's holding the dog. We're seeing the more like tender emotional experience that we tend to see as ideal as it relates to grief. Right? Like we tend to look at grief and be like, oh, if you're crying and you're sad or whatever, you're doing it right. Which isn't necessarily true. But when Kratos sees that, he sees his son in pain. He sees his son hurting. And in order for Kratos to really acknowledge that for what it is, he has to connect with it somehow. Which means that seeing his son sad and being in that moment stirs that up for him. But Kratos does not have as much of a willingness to go into that. Kratos has learned over his life that when he experienced that, he needs to challenge it and get into a sense of preparedness for an impending threat. Death potentially being that. So he trains. So there's behavioral activation for Kratos as a form of grieving or as a form of just acknowledgement that like this sucks. So I really do believe that when he tries to hand that bow to Atreus and say, now we train, I truly believe he's trying to take care of Atreus. I think what he's trying to do is say, hey man, this is a reality of the life we live and it really sucks. And so you got to train or else you're going to get lost in this stuff and it's super painful and it's, and it's awful. So let's train. Let's channel this into behavioral activation that throughout my life has in some ways worked for me. Because I can't get into this. That's his context. That's empathy for Kratos in that moment. Atreus, yeah, looks at him and says, are you kidding me? <laughs> We're going to train? That's all we do. You can't take two seconds to like acknowledge that Fenrir just died? Like what the hell, dude? And, but think about that. When Atreus lost somebody who was incredibly important to him in the form of his mother, they did acknowledge that. They went through a huge journey to the top of the mountain with her ashes. So Atreus has a very limited point of reference and because he's in his emotions, he probably in that moment wants to have his experience mirrored by his father to experience validation. Truth of the matter is both of them are experiencing a degree of invalidation by being next to each other because Atreus is not getting the warmth and acknowledgement that he wants and Kratos isn't getting the shutdown that he wants. So there's this misaligned wavelength here. And what that really comes down to is the fact that when an event happens that spawns grief for people, different people show up in that grief in different ways relative to their experiences that they've had leading up to it. So there needs to be a co-experience of grief that does not have to be the same in order for it to be valid. Atreus can grieve the way that he does. Kratos can grieve the way that he, grieve the way that he does. There's just some problem solving to be done there. And I give Atreus credit for standing up to Kratos a bit there and saying, I don't want to train. Now, I do wish that he might have said something along the lines of like, I just need to be with Fenrir right now for a few minutes and then I'll train and would appreciate it if you could just be patient with me. But I also don't know that he's fully developed the sense of autonomy to be able to do that with Kratos because Kratos is a very powerful figure in his life. So they are still having to figure each other out. As any parent will tell you, parenting is just 20 years of figuring it out. 
you never have it fully figured out because your kid is constantly developing and so are you. And we're seeing that here. So it's parallel grief. It doesn't have to intersect. It doesn't have to be the same. But there's empathy to be had for both of them. But be mindful of who in that scene you had the most empathy for because that'll give you some insight into your own orientation to grief. Look. I have a moment alone with Fenrir before I bury him. Come on, you can go there, Kratos. No, you need a moment alone, too. That's okay. I love his respect for that. Big kudos to Kratos on that. Well, I recognize that dull expression anywhere. <laughs> Care to tell me what went wrong? The wolf is gone. Oh, no. Not Fenrir. How's the lad taking it? Not well. He goes to bury him. Oh, damn it. All right, brother. This is what you're here for, is for me to nitpick the shit out of this, so I'm going to do it. This is a language thing, and I, I, as those of you that have watched many of these playthroughs, you know that I'm big on language. And I do acknowledge ahead of time that this is slightly nitpicky. But when Mimir asks, how is Atreus handling it? And Kratos says, not well. That is interesting to me. Because that's a qualifying piece of language. That's a, There's a judgment there. of It makes me as a therapist want to ask Kratos, what would you consider to be taking it well? Would it be that your son appears to be unaffected by it? And went out and said, hey, dad, let's go train. Is that what you would say? Is handling it well? I would love to know what Kratos' answer to that would be. Because it would also give us insight into how Kratos is currently be a, being affected by it. It suggests to me that there is maybe some degree, not malicious, but there's some degree of comparison of Kratos' way of managing this and Atreus. And the thing that we would really want to make sure that we steer Kratos away from is this idea that somehow he's doing it better because he's seen so much death in his life that it's just another one. And that the way that Atreus would do well with this would be to acknowledge it, train, and move on. There's really no such thing as grieving well. I would argue that Atreus acknowledging and validating his emotional experience, advocating for some time alone, pushing back against his dad and taking that moment with Fenrir is grieving well, is taking it well, because he's acknowledging that this is yet another death and a slew of very important deaths in his life that have happened in a very short window of time relative to how long he's going to live. So... It's a little piece of language. It's a bit nitpicky. It may be that Kratos just means he's not doing well in the sense that like he's hurt by it. But that piece of language, I think, is an important one just to be mindful of. Good night, then. A lot of loss, bud. It's a lot for you to take, too.
Kratos? Oh, shit. Are you joining me? Oh, boy. I would be very... Are you ready? <laughs> I would love to know if Kratos considers this to be a good dream or a nightmare. Something tells me it's a bit of both. This is his dead wife, by the way. For those who don't know, it's very clear we're dreaming. And, uh... Ooh, baby. Be very careful to over... Acknowledge the... like, Or to overly place importance on dreams. Dreams give you some window into things that you're thinking about, but dreams are not the end-all, be-all reflection of your subconscious, like we tend to think that they are. So I'm not, like, ready to overanalyze this dream, per se, but I do think the things that are going to happen in it are going to be very interesting. But, this is, wow. Where are we going? You walk as though Emir himself sits atop your shoulders. This is your hunt. I will follow. Very well, Grumbles. Ooh. Ooh. My man's willing to be subordinate to his wifey. Fresh kill. At least it didn't suffer. Hmm. Am I to decipher your grunting? <laughs> Tell me your thoughts. We hunt a predator. A wolf. Yes. Predators kill. It is the natural order of things. Your words are misguided. Oh, I'm going to have a field day with this one. Shh. Approach slowly. It's okay, little one. We want to help. Don't we? No, no. Don't. Come on. The sick wolf we found beyond our stave. He found his way inside. As I said he would. We should have acted. It was not our concern. Now it is. A problem doesn't have to reach our doorstep for it to be our responsibility. If we have the power to limit the harm it could cause, we should act. That's why we train. Who are we to hide and do nothing? We are not hiding. See how his hands are balled up in a fist? He's postured. There's an intensity here. But holy shit, is it good. Um, she is a force. And... That is almost certainly what Kratos, I'm going to say wants instead of needs. And when I say it that way, what I mean by this is she takes some of the responsibility away from Kratos to do his own work. And that's not, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. 
but she goes in like a battering ram on him by calling him grumbles by basically saying use your words by pushing against him and taking the leadership role by holding him accountable to his at times very limited short-mindedness there is a level of submissiveness that Kratos gets to engage in relative to her because she pulls some of the weight for him on that by scaffolding it. And again, it's a good thing because it means that Freya understands that Kratos developmentally isn't there. It's what makes it, I think, so attractive for Kratos and why he would be interested in engaging with her. Because she's meeting him where he's at. Faye, that's what I mean. Sorry. She's meeting him where he's at. And as much as Kratos may want to be the leader and be stoic and thinks it's better or whatnot. There is a part of him. I think that knows that validation is needed and that these things are important. And so she levels him, I think in a way that is gentle yet forceful. She is able to weave through the oscillation that I was talking about a while back and that is cool. Now, that all of that said, all of that said, there is something we have to take into account here, which is that this is not actually her. This is his projection of her. This is his idealized version of her. This is how Kratos sees her, because this is happening in Kratos' mind. This isn't her. This is what Kratos thinks of her this is the internalized object of Faye that he has so what we really are learning about here is what kratos valued in her and even if it's a memory it's still a memory that exists as his projection and internalized object of Faye. It's not necessarily the reality of what happened because memory is limited. So the things that we're seeing are the things that stood out to him. They are the things that in his mind defined Fay for him. So calling him grumbles, being sassy, being forceful, taking the lead. These are the things that he liked about her, or even if he didn't necessarily like about her, that he remembers and that he valued and that he idealized. So this tells us more about Kratos and what he's into and what mattered to him than it tells us about Faye, because this is a limited projection of Faye. Always important to remember that, in part because whenever you are listening to somebody talk about somebody else, you are not hearing the objective reality of that other person. You are hearing the perception of the person who is telling you. Whenever a person is talking to you about somebody else, you're learning more about the person who's talking to you than you are the person they're talking about. You should try to make as many direct observations of people as possible. How much you want to bet she could pick up all three of these at once, but she's letting him do this so he feels powerful. <sighs> Gonna make me pick that one up? <laughs> oh, man, I love it. 
Good boy. for everybody, okay, but I <laughs> Sometimes the thing that people are most attracted to in an in an intimate partner You have to remember we're not just attracted to other people. We're not just attracted to the significant other or others. We are also attracted to what that person brings out in us. And what I really think Faye brings out in Kratos more than anything else is the sense that, like, he doesn't always have to take the lead. That he is not always in control. That sometimes he can rely on other people, and sometimes there are other people that know better than he does. And there is something, I think, that really gets him going on that because it's novel relative to how he lives the rest of his life. And I also think that it's something where he gets to um, indulge that part of himself that he doesn't get to indulge very often because of what his directive is. Uh, something I want to throw out because I've seen this said a couple times in chat and I just want to nip it in the bud. Y'all got to stop with the whole top and bottom shit. Like, calling her the top and Kratos bottom, you gotta drop that shit now. That's gonna be removed from chat from now on. The idea that if a person is the top, they're dominant, and they're the bottom, they're submissive or whatever, is a completely oversimplified version of how we generally think about that kind of language, and it really just doesn't have a place for how we're talking about this stuff. So knock it off. <clears throat> Alright, let's keep going. How do I climb this? Oh, there we go. This way. Very. Yeah, Kratos, you lost Fenrir too. So now we are seeing a little bit of the con, uh, confluence of grief. Very. Very. Rise! Time is running out, my love, and there is much to do. Mother! Mother! Brother? Where's Atreus? Hence my bellowing. He never came back from burying the wolf. Oh, Jesus. In some time. He cannot be far. Uh, I am going to read the codex. It has been too long since Faye left us and we spread her ashes from the highest peak in Jotunheim. A journey she planned, one that neither of us was ready for. I dream of her. In, oh, it's I'm not going to do a Kratos voice. I dream of her in simpler times when being together was enough. My duty now lies solely with our son, but I still have so many questions for her. So much that I still do not understand. I see glimmers of her in Atreus, and they make me smile, but am left with the same questions as I try to guide him along this path. He's focused on who he will become, and while it becomes difficult to keep him close, I'm grateful I can continue this journey with him for now. The wolf, Fenrir, has been in decline for some time now. Atreus cares for the animal deeply and has not been able to accept that he is dying. 
In the past, I would have told him to close his heart to this loss, but he has already endured so much. Rock on, Kratos. I see the compassion in his heart, and I am proud of the man he is growing into. But I must keep him focused if he is to be ready for more dark days ahead. Tell him that, Kratos. Oh, God, I hope he tells him that. Not long ago, we rescued a pack of wolves from raiders on the Lake of Nine. Despite my warnings, Atreus decided to name them. Having those two pull the sled has made transportation significantly easier. I'm guessing that the reason that Kratos did not want Atreus to name the wolves is because he needed to keep them as objects of utility. When you name animals or if you name something, it immediately personalizes it from an interpersonal and linguistic perspective. So as soon as we call them Specky and Svana, I'm guessing that's how you say it. Uh-oh. Now they are family. So Kratos, I think, probably tries to keep all of these things as objectified as possible because it allows him to do the stuff that he needs to do without having to attend the deeper emotion that comes along with this stuff. Mimir has lived with us since our return from Jotunheim. I have known few I would call friend and brother fewer still, but I have come to rely on the wisdom and counsel of the smartest man alive. Also, he is compact and does not consume precious resources. Oh, man. Always the pragmatist. <laughs> All right. Freya is a foe. Freya continues to pursue us, seeking revenge for the death of her son, Balder. I do not wish to fight her. She was a friend, but I will defend myself if she forces my hand. I do not see a peaceful resolution to our situation. Oof. I do not regret Baldur's death. Had I allowed him to kill Freya, he would not have abandoned pursuit. His fate would have been the same. I do not expect Freya to accept what happened as necessary. She will likely pursue us until one of us is dead. I love the empathy there. Uh, what's funny is now we see where Baldur got his tendency to pursue. Like, I like, like mother, like son, I guess. Magni and Modi, the sons of Thor, also pursued us on our journey. Magni was strong but arrogant until his last breath. Modi proved himself a coward, but I pitied him in his last moments. There seems to be little forgiveness among our Aesir god gods, and I expect that we have yet to suffer the consequences of the blood we spilled. Lesson. I'll read the I'll read the codex when I remember to. Yeah, Baldur was a dick. I really can't emphasize that enough. If y'all haven't played 2018, Baldur was a douche. And we really weren't given a lot of context on why he was a douche. So I don't have very many empathic statements to make about him because he, he was a douche. <laughs> and I don't say that lightly. I usually try to find empathy, but man, oh man. This has not been opened. No prints this way either. Okay. Oh, I got Mimir with me. All right. Let's see. Tracks heading down to the frozen river. That's most likely where he did the burying. Also, can we briefly just talk about how unbelievably beautiful this game is? Holy crap. Fire's dwindling now. Where else could he have gone from here? Perhaps through that hole? No, he wouldn't have dragged the dog through that hole. There's the other dogs. Is this the PS5 version? It is, yes. Craig, thank you very much for the sub. Appreciate that. He crawled through here. Okay. And as I hack through this wall, I do want to say I really appreciate all of you for being here. Thank you for taking time to hang out for this playthrough and supporting what I do. It, it really means a lot to me. Whether you're here on Twitch or whether you are watching this on YouTube. You seem troubled in your sleep, even for you. Nightmares? 
I dream of the past. Almost every night. Ah, the bad old days in Greece? No. It feels like Faye is trying to tell me something. You don't mean to say you're talking to ghosts again, brother? No. But it is something more than memory. Hmm. Cool that he's willing to open up to Mimir. I mean, he did say that he calls him brother, but uh, that's a... I mean, it's a pretty big deal that Kratos is willing to acknowledge this stuff to Mimir. Do you think having Mimir on his keychain facing backwards indicates a level of trust from Kratos to watch his back? 100%. Yes. Uh, I think that Kratos actually trusts Mimir more than he trusts his own son. And I don't mean that that's a bad thing for Atreus. I just think Kratos really values the knowledge and wisdom that Mimir brings because it adds... like. Kratos is the brute force, and Mimir is the brains. And Atreus can learn from both. Hmm. Where are you at, Atreus? Use your words, brother. The tracks stop here. Thousand and we're not alone. I love, I love that Mimir can say the same thing that Faye says to him. Use your words. On your right. I don't remember how. I don't know how to. Oh, it's right. Raider, left flight. These guys think they have any they kind of chance. Be this close. We should check on the protection, Steve. There's a tree up ahead, yeah? Now, something that's interesting to me about this is that Kratos' first reaction to this is not, oh god, Atreus is in trouble. So it shows that there is some level of trust that Atreus could probably hold his own against these raiders. Like, Kratos isn't like, oh god, we have to go get him because Atreus is helpless. There's a bit of acknowledgement here passively that like, nah, my son's probably okay. I've trained him well, and I'm sure he held his own. We don't see urgency from either of them. So a little bit of a, some positive growth. Do you think there's a level of utility in the relationship with Mimir based on the sort of control he also has over Mimir's existence in current body situation? 100% sure. 100%. Yeah. I, I do think that Mimir being bodiless and, and submissive to whatever Kratos needs to bring him on is good but i think it's because kratos doesn't see him necessarily as being like somebody that's getting in the way physically he is purely there for emotional support whether he wants to acknowledge it or not and for the intellectual support and being able to cover his back absolutely Well, you were right. The stave is broken. Explains our trespassers. What happened here? Oh boy. That's a big old bear. A bear. Mauled. By what? A larger bear. Wounded. The fight destroyed the tree. We must find Atreus. Aye. Between the savage beasts and marauding raiders, he may have sought shelter. Follow the trail. We'll find him. Again, no urgency on the idea that he couldn't hold his own. It's good stuff. <clears throat> this is so pretty. Oh my god. I just, like, good lord. Also, this would be a great opportunity for me to give a quick shout out. The reason I have a PlayStation 5 to even be able to play this game is because some anonymous person sent one to my P.O. box. Whoever you are, if you happen to be watching this, 
Thank you very much for making this playthrough possible. We need a way around. Aha! Trail's on the other side of that gap, if you can clear the way. I'm going to say this up front. I really hope this game is not overly handholdy. We won't find him this way. Let's find that trail of blood. <laughs> Mimir, why don't you chill, bud, and let me figure this out, huh? What is this? Ugh. Gotta kill all these bugs real quick. Mimir is definitely on the back seat. Any idea what could have made the lad wander off? We argued. He accuses me of... hiding from Odin. Eh, only sensible to keep a low profile after killing three of his kin. A <laughs> reckoning will come. That is why Atreus must learn to survive on his own. Oh, this is about that prophecy. Just because the giants had you dead on some wall full of... otherwise accurate predictions... <laughs> I do not believe in prophecies. Well... <laughs> Good. <laughs> so okay so what we have there is an acknowledgement that at some point kratos sees this as him needing to die and atreus is going to be on his own which means that a lot of this planning for the inevitable is potentially kratos saying to atreus planning for my death but I don't get a sense that Kratos has specifically said that to Atreus, probably as an act of caregiving. Of like, I don't want to tell my son that I'm going to die eventually and he's going to be on his own because that's going to suck for him and he's going to do everything he can to try to prevent that, probably at his own risk. Because Atreus has shown a propensity for stepping out beyond his means to try to protect his dad. Because I think he sees that protectiveness that Kratos provides and values that immensely so there's going to be some real conversations to be had here what i am worried may happen for kratos as it gets closer to the inevitable so to speak is that kratos may put distance emotionally between himself and atreus thinking that that's going to make it easier for atreus to lose him and that may be one of the worst things that he could do it is okay to engage in a meaningful relationship with your son up until the very end and to use that as an opportunity to have a close relationship to him. Some people, when they know that something's going to happen, if they're terminally ill, if there's something going on, they'll start to push people away because they think they're protecting people. They think they're protecting themselves. And really what that does is leave an additional sense of emptiness when the person inevitably does die because you couldn't appreciate the time that you had left with that person. So we're going to be watching that and be mindful of that with Kratos as he acknowledges that because his tendency is to default to distance. And we don't want that for Atreus, nor do we want that for Kratos. You can change the back seating and the accessibility settings. I think I did that. I'm going to check it really quick, though, because... Audio cues screen off, reader. screen reader off, Amos. Yeah, I think I turned a lot of these things off. I am going to turn motion blur down now because I hate motion blur. Um, yeah. That's all right. We're good. I 
find my way around that. And here's the blood trail. So there we go. Thank you for your silver, sir. Or madam, or zir, or whatever. Or hack silver. Man, Atreus really dragged the dog a long ass way. Do you believe in prophecy? I'm skeptical by nature, though we have seen things that defy explanation. So, speaking as the smartest man alive, I have no bloody idea. Kratos doesn't ask people their perspective things very on things very often. So, him asking. Mimir, if he believes in prophecies, I actually think could potentially be Kratos seeking a bit of reassurance. Because Kratos values what Mimir has to say, and I would venture a guess that if Kratos could access it and name it, he would tell us that he's anxious about the fact that he could potentially die as the prophecy foretells. And I think his anxiety would probably be more related to how that's going to affect Atreus than it is him accepting his own death. Just because of how immersed in death he's been for a long time. And so Kratos asks that question to Mimir, potentially hoping that he's either going to say what he said, which is that, nah, it's bullshit. Or saying, nah, it's probably true. Either way, he gets an answer from somebody that he perceives to have more knowledge about the situation than he does. And so I commend Kratos for his willingness to reach out to that. And I don't see that as re excessive reassurance. And I give Mimir credit for answering honestly, essentially saying, I don't know. Because if he said something as some form of curated response, because he was trying to finagle Kratos in some way, I think that is antithetical to creating the trust and depth that their relationship has. So as much as Kratos may not like that answer, may like may not like the ambiguity of the answer, maybe it jacks his anxiety a little bit more. I think he can appreciate that Mimir is honest with him. And that's very important. And it's a lesson to all of us that like honesty, even when you have to say the difficult thing, in the long run is generally going to create a better rapport and is going to cultivate a lot more respect in a relationship because you're not trying to sugarcoat stuff you're willing to acknowledge the things you know and the things you don't know and be real. And it's just a little tidbit of how this depth of relationship is built between Kratos and Mimir and why he trusts him in the way that he does. He literally trusts him to watch his back. Frost Awaken. Hold triangle to frost up the axe. Powering up the next melee or range attack! Exclamation point. Cool. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. I want me my I want some glaives, man. The glaives are my favorite thing to use in this. Itch! Yeah! I love that it hurts them on the way back too. Excellent. All right, where's that trail gone? Great question, Mimir. Also, this game runs smooth as butter, man. Mm. Oh, shit! Maybe don't yell at me before you get here, and maybe you'd have a chance. I don't love when people give their position away by screaming. <laughs> Ooh, all right. Figure out a way to get up there. Oh, shit. Who's this guy? All right, we 
gotta go up there. No! Oh. No! oh. Okay. I thought that was Freya for a second. Few humans are left in the wild woods these days. Those who survive have either stashed themselves away in the warmest places they can find, or should they choose not to hide, have only fended off the cold by transmorgifying their philia, their guardian spirit. This part of their soul takes the traits of an animal, allowing them to adapt to Midgard's unforgiving climate. As of late, the various remaining raiders around the Wildwoods seem hellbent on murdering a lo the lot of us. The protection stave keeps interlopers at bay, but every hunting trip beyond its borders inevitably results in encountering a scouting party or two. Raider Scout. While most raiders favor the strength and pride of the stag for their fielsia, scouts favor the owl for its sharp eyes and sharper talons. They often claim to be able to peer through the eyes of Midgard's owls, but this strikes me as boastful havers. They favor ranged attacks and are deadly accurate with their slings. Yeah, stay up in the air. Love juggling these guys. Yeah. Too many for a scouting party. They must have a camp nearby. I know what you're thinking, brother. But Atreus can handle himself. You've taught him well. So he keeps telling me. Mmm, a little reassurance. Mimir, you know, you get it. That's the thing, right? Is like everybody knows that Kratos is an anxious dude. That's why he tries to plan. We'll have to find another way up. It's why we he can tries. Go through, but we can go around. It's why he tries to make sure that he's got his bases covered. It's because the world is filled with unknowns. Kratos is constantly attending to it, and he wants to cultivate as much control of his environment as he possibly can. And Mimir knows that. Everybody knows that. And Kratos probably looks at anxiety as weak. But as we talk about all the time in any playthrough you ever watch with me, anxiety is not a bad thing. Anxiety is just your brain saying, hey, there's some unknown variables here that we have to attend to, and let's get activated. So it's what you do when you're anxious that makes the difference. It's not trying to get rid of the anxiety. And I really do think Kratos would do well to acknowledge it over time because literally everybody else can see it. Faye can see it. Amir can see it. Atreus can see it. And he gets kind of, ah, when people notice it. Not so much there. But it's okay to own the fact that you're anxious about stuff. Ah! Forged iron and hex silver. Cool. Torches. And the trail leads into that cave. Well, we know where we are going. I'm sure we can find a quiet way in. All right, all right. I get it. I'm loud. Or you could do that. <laughs> These the raiders you rescued the wolves from? No. They have not been here long. Death from above. Sprint off a ledge. Once in the air, press R1 to unleash a death from above attack. Or don't, because you forgot how to jump. How do I jump? Doesn't matter now. The trail goes through here. Leads deeper in. There will be more. We will handle them well. the way I came in. Destroy every barrel in the game. Might as well freeze that up.
Well, someone got in the bear's way. Takiro, thank you for the sub. Ooh. Oh, shit. Alright, I gotta remember how to dodge. Is it X? The detail. Mm. Very much appreciate the amount of detail that goes into even these tiny little caves. Absolutely fabulous. Oh, he jumps automatically. Okay, so it's like basically it's like a Zelda game. Yeah, we'll see if they can jump over here, huh? Dick. No, no, no. Why don't you try it again? Come on, try it again. Come on, come on, come on. No! How the hell do I open this thing? I want what's in that chest. in here oh, yeah. oh. Atreus, yeah. are you here? the trail leads back out we'll need our own way up to find it again all right more forged iron love that perhaps atreus came here seeking shelter kept moving when he saw the raiders and the bear came barreling after. Impressive rampage, I'll give it that. You think the bear was chasing Atreus? Well, just as likely the bear was hurt and Atreus was chasing it to help. You know the lad. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Interesting, okay. How long was I asleep? Good Lord. Like Atreus freaking walked to the other side of Jotunheim. Atreus, where are you? Never mind that. There's the bear here. Oh shit. The orn. Oh, he found us. Oh, he seems angry. Oh, shit. Too, bitch. Oh, 
Holy shit! I prayed Fenrir. And then I'm. I'm not sure. I was so sad. And then I was angry. And scared. I remember. running? There was a bear. Charging and I charged back. That had to be a dream. Your emotions. They transformed you. Uh, I, I, I didn't know I could do that. taught me discipline. I need more than that. I need answers. Answers you don't have. Answers only your mother had. That's what she withheld. What if there was someone who could help us? Someone that could give us answers about the giants and who Loki's supposed to be? Atreus. Wouldn't it help to understand what I'm becoming? Atreus! Listen to me. killed you until you learn control we will take no unnecessary risks inaction is also a risk you taught me that stop thinking like a father for a moment and start thinking like a general no Wow. So Kratos is angry at Faye. Because Faye could have given them information that would potentially fill in some of these gaps that cause a lot of anxiety and unknowns for Atreus and Kratos and lead to some of these events where they find themselves, in this case, attacking each other without realizing it. That's a very important step in how both of them process not just the death of Faye, 
but their relationship going forward. I actually think it's kind of cool that Kratos is not willing to fall on the sword for Faye. I think it speaks to his attention of the development of Atreus to being old enough now to be able to understand some of the nuances of adult decision making. And the unresolved nature of death, because death is a cutoff, it freezes people's relationships in place, however they are when the person dies. It's leading to anger because both of them feel helpless against what it is that they're battling and are the person that could help them is not available. So it, it constantly means that Faye has a presence with them and has a presence per, perhaps in a way that they don't want her to have a presence. The first years, the first God of War 2018 was all about being bummed out that she's not there. Now they're having to acknowledge the realities that the world goes on without her and there are things that they don't have access to because she's not there. And that is why we never want to talk about grief as a linear process. Linear it, it, or grief is contextual. Grief is something that changes over time based on the needs of the environment post whatever event led to the grief. So where they were able to access sadness and longing, now they're having to access anger at the cutoff itself because they're at risk as a result of this. And Kratos in particular is seeing that his son is in trouble because they don't have answers about this stuff. And he can't help his son by giving him the answers. And Atreus makes that very well known to him. And that's rough for both of them. So their mother, is, Atreus's mother is ever-present in a way that they probably don't want. So, okay, a couple other things from this scene. <clears throat> when Kratos is talking to Atreus about how he must control his emotions because they overcame him. Kratos isn't wrong. It's interesting that there's an actual manifestation of being taken over of, of emotional intensity going up in the sense that like apparently Atreus can turn into a bear or potentially other animals or whatever. I'm sure we're going to find out more later. But there's like real consequence to that. Kratos isn't wrong. But I want to add nuance to how you would actually facilitate that process with Atreus in the context of like therapy and in like a real life circumstance, which is that it's not about overcoming the emotion. It's not about putting the emotion in its place. What it's about is acknowledging an emotion for what it is and then immediately directing our focus after the validation to how do I respond to it? What does it mean for me? And there's a couple steps to that. The first thing is that you have to learn what an emotional response is likely to lead to behaviorally if you leave yourself on autopilot. That's the first thing. The second thing is then to ask yourself, what is my ideal response to the emotion? And if your answer is, well, I don't want the emotion to happen in the first place, you are in the wrong space. The anger that and fear that Atreus experienced when he buried Fenrir is valid and it's there whether he wants to acknowledge it or not. So then it becomes, what is the appropriate, healthy, meaningful response to the emotion that can either mitigate it, change it, or perhaps even harness it for further behavioral activation? And I think that's what Kratos is getting at here is, hey, dude, you're learning now what's going to happen when you experience this fear and this anger. And as your father and somebody who just acknowledged 20 minutes ago that I'm not always going to be here, you are going to have to learn how to respond to your emotions without my aid. You're going to have to learn what this means for you to be angry, to be sad, to be scared. 
And that's going to change over time. But let's figure out how we can make sure that you feel a sense of awareness and intention in the way that you respond to it. To expand on that a little bit further beyond what will likely be a TikTok clip is you want to think about, I'm actually going to zoom out for this for a second for folks that are interested in it. The metaphor that I like to use with this is to talk about emotions as a circuit. So you have elect like electricity or energy in the form of your automatic emotional response to something that goes into the circuit. You then have the opportunity to wire that circuit in such a way that the output is something that is more ideal for you. So if you send that through the autopilot of the circuit might mean that like, and the circuit, by the way, is the way that you frame your emotion, validate it, and what you do to act on it. So you have, say, Atreus gets angry and scared. And then his frame for that is, I shouldn't feel that way, and I need to attack it head on. And I need to stop the thing that's making me angry. And so then he goes and he charges in and he is unprepared and he gets his ass kicked as a result of it. And then it increases his anger. We would suggest at that point that the way that he wired the circuit led to an overloaded output that was not ideal. So you want to rewire that circuit. You can't control the current in, but you can wire that circuit in such a way that maybe the output is a mitigation of the anger or perhaps it reroutes the energy to something more productive. So maybe Atreus in this moment acknowledges that he's sad, he's scared, he's angry. He says, okay, this usually tends to lead to me being a bit impulsive on how I act. What is it that I need to do? I need to evaluate my circumstance. I need to make a decision about how I'm going to respond. And I need to make sure that that's intentional and conscientious. And so then maybe he decides I'm going to leave the environment. I'm, I'm going to leave the bear down there and I'm going to go back to camp and go back to my dad. And I'm going to focus on validating that emotion and paying attention to my needs in my environment. And maybe that mitigates the emotion. It mitigates the current. That's the metaphor that I tend to like to use with that is to think about your, your thoughts and your behaviors as the circuitry that routes the input. You cannot change the input into that circuit. You can only change what the circuit does with it. And I realize I'm not an electrical engineer, so if I'm saying circuit and that's dumb and you're like no that's a transformer or that's a whatever like bear with me i'm a therapist i hope it makes sense all one sincere all right back to the game uh oh the other thing when he says be a general and not my dad and kratos says no that's cool i think it's an acknowledgement on kratos's part that like dad is first and foremost his priority and that he can't detach himself from that and to me, that's a lot of growth for Kratos because I think he would respond more like a general a few years ago. And having some of the reparative experiences that he had with Atreus, in some ways with Freya and with Faye and with Mimir, I think has led him to a point where he now is a lot more in tune with like, no, this is where I'm at. I'm in dad mode and I'm not ready to let go of that yet. He thought about it. And Atreus, I think, is understandably scared. Imagine that, right? Imagine that, chat. You are in a position where you are grieving, and then all of a sudden you wake up and you're bloody, and your dad almost killed you because you turned into a bear. That would be terrifying. Atreus essentially got roofied here and doesn't have answers. He has no... That would be terrifying. He lost all control of his faculties and doesn't know why. That anger, that emotion has got to go somewhere. And because Kratos is proximal to him, he is likely going to take it out on Kratos. It's what all of us do. And it's scary because if he, if he was scared and then turned into a bear, what does that mean if he acknowledges the fear associated with the fact that he turned into a bear? Does it mean that that could happen again? Does it mean that it could happen worse? There's a lot of unknowns that are being injected into Atreus's life right now, which means that his anxiety is going to spike immensely, which means that Kratos needs to be ready to attend to that and to be mindful of his own anxiety and his own role relative to that because Atreus does in some ways have to figure this out, but it's also okay for him to take that protective dad role, 
but it's going to need to equalize over time. As a quick small aside, was that calm yourself to the kid or to himself based on his traveling over the general father statement? I think it's both. I think it's both. Yeah, and I agree, DL, that like Kratos acknowledging that he can't turn the dad thing off is a big deal. Very important. Because then Atreus knows what he's working with. And I think that's a remnant in some ways of Atreus learning from Kratos to orient himself to these intense moments like this by being more pragmatic. I think there's a part of Atreus that admires that Kratos is able to become really stoic. And I'm actually going to talk about this, I think, in a little bit more depth. I think Atreus has learned that in watching Kratos go into that kind of general mode, he probably perceives Kratos as not attending to the emotion that's at hand. He probably thinks, my God, this is painful to be uncertain about what's going on with myself, and I don't know what to make of that. And I watch my dad always just train and become a general and go stoic, and it seems like that serves him really well. And so when Kratos is willing to acknowledge some of the emotion and soften, in some ways I think that freaks Atreus out because it throws off the equilibrium. Kratos, he's really used, Atreus is really used to Kratos becoming the let's train. And as much as he hated that back at camp, now he's like, dude, dad, I need that. I don't, please don't soften and acknowledge this for me. I need that. I kind of wish I could do that. And so Kratos saying, no, I'm going to be dad is in a lot of ways him creating what we would call second order change, which is he's kind of changing the rules and the dynamic itself and saying, uh-uh, I'm not going to go full general here. I am, as I wrote in my journal, proud of you for the fact that you can engage in these emotions. And I'm not going to take that away from you because as much as it may seem that me locking this down and becoming stoic is really helpful and I don't have to feel these things. I do feel them. I just don't express them. I don't have an outlet for it. And that kind of sucks too. And I don't want you to be dealing with that as well. As a reminder to those who may be new here or just coming in midway through, do not spoil. Do not this back way. seat. It's a very quick way to get yourself removed. So, are we going to discuss the boy becoming a bear? Yeah. Are we? Not now. We need to repair the protection stave and get home. What happened to the protection stave? You did. So you're blaming me? I am not blaming you, Atreus. Well, tell your voice that. <laughs> Blame, when true, is fine. You can say that there is accountability there and that the reason we don't have the protection stave is because Atreus broke it, and that is reality. Now, when Atreus hears Kratos say it's your fault it likely feels very childlike for him which is i have disappointed you i have let you down i have created risk and if there's anything we know about kratos is that he's incredibly risk averse and that he always does everything he can to try to mitigate it so Atreus hearing Kratos state that fact and hearing it as blame, I think is probably that childlike remnant of the fact that if I acknowledge that and take accountability for it, it means something about our relationship dynamic or that I've let you down. And that's not necessarily true. There's nothing to be ashamed about. This happened. You don't know why it happened. That's really scary. And I think this is where Kratos could use a bit of a boost in saying, hey, Atreus, it's okay. You did break it. We don't know why. I understand why that's frustrating. You are to blame for the fact that it's broken, but that doesn't affect our relationship. I don't think of you differently as the result of that. We have to take accountability for what it is that happened, and now we have to problem solve. That would be the way that you would want him to attend to that because it's very mature, and it also 
speaks to again atreus's emerging sense of autonomy and also the fact that like your actions do have consequences on the environment you have impact even if your intentions are good or even if you don't know why you did what you did this would be no different than if atreus got totally hammered and then busted the staff and the creditors is like yeah you got drunk and you broke the staff you broke it you're accountable for that but now we're going to work together to fix it it's okay to take accountability So I think Atreus is just trying to buffer that of like, I want my dad to be proud of me. I want my dad to see me as somebody who's capable. And if he's going to bring to my attention that I broke this staff, it runs against that. And that's really a bummer for me. So Kratos can do a little bit of work there to help him understand that it's not going to affect that dynamic. Say the word, father. Hell yeah. Fire. Your arrow didn't do shit, dude. Mister. Oh. Ranger on the left! No, I made it, dude. So, lad, besides your gift of language and hearing creatures' thoughts, are there any other new magical abilities to report? Not really. What of Fenrir? What about him? When he died, you cast a spell. No, I didn't. But I saw light. I don't know what you're talking about. Hmm. Trick of Fimble Winter, perhaps. Seen my share. So Atreus didn't see that? I saw it. You all saw it. Interesting. What will that mean? Oh, I recognize where we are now. Oh, we're in the bug cave. Hey. What's with all the blood? Yours, Atreus. Seriously? That, or any prey you might have been dragging, I suppose. Not sure that makes me feel any better. Oh, wow, so it's when he was the bear. I guess that would make sense, because he was, like, really busting shit up if he was that big ass. Can I talk to him? Oh, that's the bear you must have taken possession of. Oh, the babies. I, I didn't mean to. Oh. Intent does not matter. Only consequences. Oh, no. What? What can we do? Nothing. Nature will take its course. Baby bears. Oh, I have I have a special place in my heart for baby bears. That's that's rough. Oh. Intent does not matter. Only consequences. Is a little bit black and white. So I want to gray it up a little bit here. Because it gets into a discussion of intent versus impact. 
whenever you are engaging in any kind of interpersonal process or whenever you influence your environment and context, you have an impact. Your actions and what you bring to the table affect people, affect things. There are consequences, as Kratos would say. No matter your intention. When the consequences of a certain action or the impact of that action is harmful to oneself or others or the environment, that impact has to be acknowledged and validated before intention matters. Almost 100% of the time. So when Kratos says that, he's not entirely wrong. Atreus didn't mean to take control of the bear. He wasn't trying to orphan the bear cubs. He wasn't trying to cause the destruction to the woods that he caused. None of that was anything he meant to do. But the reality is, the bear cubs are orphaned. The forest is destroyed. He did turn into a bear. And that had consequence. Atreus will need to learn to acknowledge and take accountability for that impact. Because the orphaned bears in this instance, if they could talk, aren't going to give a shit that he didn't mean to. What they care about is that he killed their mom. And so if he can acknowledge that, take accountability for it, maybe even apologize for it if he is actually sorry for the fact that that happened, then if the bears were people, they might be more receptive to the fact that he didn't mean to do it. But the order of operations should be impact over intent. And a lot of things break down interpersonally when people try to negate impact by discussing their intent. Try to avoid doing that. Your intentions, you can know your intentions, you can validate your intentions, but you've got to acknowledge the impact it has on others when you engage in certain ways. Because if you don't do that, you're going to isolate yourself. So Kratos is deeply pragmatic there and is talking about the consequences. And I think that's an important lesson for Atreus to learn. Because even though it, I, think it, I think it fills more of this educational perspective that Kratos is wanting to take on this of like, we need to be careful. Because if you don't know how this happens and you don't have control over this, you're going to continue to see consequences that you're not going to like and might actually cause problems in this world, both for me, for you, and everybody in it. And so this is a very experiential moment where Atreus sees that he orphaned two bear cubs by taking control of the bear, which maybe reinforces for him, holy shit, my dad's right, we gotta figure this out. So I think it's good that Kratos was willing to be a bit cold-hearted there and, and focus on the consequences there so that Atreus actually learns a lesson. Storms are coming. Isn't it cold enough? We are almost home. You said almost 100% of the time. What would be an exception to that rule? I don't have something off the top of my head. What I will say is that I also am a big believer in giving people the benefit of the doubt when you can. Oftentimes, people do not act on malintent. Some people do. And in some cases, you have to be more careful than others. But, you know, there may be times where, like, somebody does something and it's very obviously accidental and assuming that a person did that on purpose can cause problems as well so it's like hey i recognize that this is accidental still if i accidentally punch you in the face i need to acknowledge the impact but we can maybe get a little bit quicker to engaging with intent as it relates to that i mean that's one example off the top of my head but generally you're going to want to go impact over intent I agree, Jobin. Will this be uploaded to YouTube? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dial right side. 
been like this all night. He must have been inside the stave when I fixed it. Ah, uh, maybe. Do you have any rules on game suggestions? Yeah, feel free to suggest them in Discord. Sometimes I really wish Tyr's temple still worked so we could get out of Midgard. They say Fimblewinter affects all realms, lad. Okay, but how could things be any worse than here? Good question. Good thing I can sport my my crop top half one sleeve and not feel any cold, huh? Should try it sometime, big guy. What are we still doing out here, brother? Let's go home. Hey, Spana, you're not scared. You're a brave girl. Good. Brave girl. That's right. He's good with them. No surprise, really. People who are brave acknowledge that they are afraid when they do the things that we consider to be brave. Bravery is not the absence of fear. I think the reason that Atreus is saying that the way that he is is because he himself is fear and if he sees fear in others or if he projects it into the dogs or whatnot it makes him have to attend to it more and he probably perceives fear as being weak bravery is the acknowledgement that there is something to be afraid of and acting in accordance with your values or with what the situation dictates Becky, you okay? Just a little thunder. That's a good girl. Good girl. One of the things that people will do sometimes when they feel afraid is they will try to take care of others. A really good way to divert yourself away from your own anxieties and your own uncertainties and your own confusion and sadness or whatnot is to project it into other things and attend to them sometimes easier to attend to things externally rather than internally and i think atreus in some ways is doing that there i also think in some ways that's what kratos does i think kratos puts a lot of stock on taking care of atreus because it means he doesn't have to take care of his own anxieties and issues not always but you know something to keep in mind you don't want to always divert your emotional experience to others atreus i'm just checking on too bad Yes, sir. Just a little thunder. Is some blonde bombshell gonna come flying down here, huh? With a with a with a hammer? As evenings go, that was entirely too eventful. I admit it was a bit like old times there for a moment. The three of us navigating some hitherto unhappened upon patch of forest. Been a while since you've joined us, if that's what you mean. There's the glaives. Well, just tired, I suppose. Give me those. You've seen one deer hunt, you've seen them all. How can you feel tired when you never sleep? There are other kinds of tired, lad. <laughs> You'll see when you're older. How many feel that? I feel that. <laughs> Thank you, SpongeBob, for the uh, for the sub. Now have a proper rest, my brothers. Things are always brighter in the morning. Yeah, something tells me that's not going to be the case.
Who is that? The ball. Come in. <laughs> what up, Thor? I have me. You would not find me good company. No. I'm sure we'll find lots to talk about. What a badass. Look how big he is. Holy shit. Nice place. Try and pick it up, Kratos. Assert dominance. Pick up Mjolnir. Little raven chilling over there. told me before I poured. Why are you here? Uh, just uh, being polite. You seem like a calm and reasonable person. Are you a calm and reasonable person? If the moment calls for a call, I'd say the moment calls for calm. <laughs> yeah. This is awesome. You know who I am? Back before winter set in, there were some misunderstandings. Regrettable ones. But I think we all have a better idea of who we're dealing with. Now, what you did to his boys, self-defense. Dying is what we Aesir live for. And let's be honest, they were kind of useless. But Balder, he had value. He was my best tracker, my closer. Yeah, his mind was gone, sure. But he had his uses, and now he's gone because of you. You follow me? No, you could be a little more clear, and we'd appreciate that a lot. You have a debt. And you're no fun anymore. <laughs> what do you want?
How about peace? How does peace strike the esteemed, retired god of war? How about we just don't kill each other? How about you stay home, kick up your feet, seek no quarrel with me, and I'll have none with you. Of course, it means that that one, that one has to stop his search for tear. Yeah, we know what you've been up to. Stop it. Tears old ways are dead. He is dead. You understand? And then that's it. Then we're square. Shit, I'll even sweeten the deal. I'll let you keep the prisoner that I know you stole. <laughs> oh, he probably that's told right. him to hide in the mirror. Yeah. You're in here somewhere, you silver tongued little shit. Why should we believe a word of you? What have your promises ever been worth? There he is, my old partner in crime. He's lost weight. If he tells you Snow is white, he's lying. What kind of wisdom is that? Can't the smartest head alive see past himself? See that we all want the same thing? All right. Here's a deal I know you can trust. I'll settle your debt with my ex. Keep Freya off your back. Keep your boy safe. It's really all you want, isn't it? So what do you say? Don't take all day. About time. I've been waiting for this. You're not from here. We got a tradition called the blood payments. It means I get a piece of you for what you took from my family. You'll pick it up. That was for Balder. Now show me this god killer I've heard so much about. Okay, I have to fight Thor? Can't fight without your axe, coward. I did not seek that fight with your brother. <laughs> I don't care. Holy How shit. How were you ever a god of war? I'm gonna get my ass kicked. This has got to Get up and hit me like a god. <laughs> You're fucking hopeless. You spit on my son's memories. I can't believe they lost to you. You insult me holding back like this. What's up, Trey? <laughs> Shit. Holy crap. I need my Berserker Rage, man, or I'm gonna lose this fight. Uh, Trey, thank you very much for the raid. Those of you come along with Trey, I'm Dr. Bick, licensed couple and family therapist. Game sessions with a therapist where we play cool games, talk about mental health, psychology, and more in an effort to destigmatize those things, bring information to people who wouldn't otherwise have it. 
in a responsible and ethical way, I am playing through God of War Ragnarok, as you can see. And uh, I am using the game to illustrate various psychological concepts. Talk about mental health and relationships. It's an educational tool. If that sounds cool, I encourage you to stick around. This VOD will be up on YouTube, so if you missed the beginning part, you can catch it there. I ask that you please not spoil her backseat. Trey, I hope you had a great stream. And again, thanks for bringing folks over here. It's very cool of you to do. There we go, bitch. You know my past. The ghost uh, of Sparta thing. Yeah. Then you know what I'm capable of. Show me. Oh, hell yeah. Ooh. Now we got us a fight. Look at you trying to remember your old rules. Afraid to get your hands dirty. Oh, shit. You should be better than this. That's all you were finally showing me. Was hoping to see your blade. Guess they don't come when you call. Stop holding back. That's for Magni. Sorry about your statue, tear, you preachy old. Oh, yeah. If you're not fighting dirty, you're not fighting, right? Oh god, now we gotta get I gotta deal with lightning. I was wondering when he was gonna start doing that. Your son struck first! Good! Let me see the monster yeah. inside. Yeah, bitch. Was it luck? Shit. Did my son die to blind fucking luck? Oh shit. Wow, I can actually hold Molnir? No way. Oh, dumbass! You think you can come here, become a daddy, get a clean slate? That ain't how it works. You're a destroyer, like me. Oh. Oh, was I not pressing hard enough? Oh, no. I say when we're done. Oh. <laughs> I'm not leaving till I see the That's real cool. you. Get up! I love that. No way, my boy, fell to this. Show me who you are. This is the god that murdered a pantheon because they hurt its feelings. in fear of you he died of the wounds you gave him oh we got a model father here this feels familiar what 
don't matter. I can give a hot shit about your fatherly advice. I want to see the god of war. Who started this? I will end it. This is the man who faced down Seagrim, the Valkyrie Queen. Yep. Yeah, how's it feel that I'm not even in my final form and I'm whooping your ass, bitch? This is the foreign god that best Yes. Your son, by the way. Remember when I killed him? I did that. Where's the love of the fight? What do you think I'm doing, dude? Oh, shit. Oh, God. Yeah. Clever. Clever won't beat me. Let the god of war out. Let me see him. Oh, shit. Who are you? Show me. Show me the killer of God. I see why my sons fell to you. Even this lesser version of you. But I am not my sons. And your boy, all father has plans for him. There he is. There is the god of war. Consider your blood debt paid. Be seeing you. What is that supposed to mean? Told you he'd make it. Kratos, it's Sindri and Brock. That was quite a fight. Can we? Oh, now! Odin is with Atreus. Oh, no. I'll go get a gateway ready. Come on, then. Ain't a long walk. That was so badass. Holy shit, that was badass. There are many differences between Thor and his brother Baldur. Baldur fought wildly, his motivation to inflict pain. Thor is calmer. His bloodlust is for the fight itself, not for the suffering it inflicts. The full force of his attack is as heavy as any I've felt. The hammer, Mjolnir, only compounds his power. Each blow echoes with the death and destruction they have wrought together. He chose to end our fight prematurely. It is good for both of us that it did not reach its conclusion. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, that's good shit. That is good shit. YouTube. Thanks for watching this. Um, I do not have many first impressions of like Odin and Thor. Uh, a lot of that was posturing. A lot of that was them putting out a front. I don't have a ton of information on their motivation. So I'm going to be interested to see what happens along the way. You'll probably get more analysis from me on them as we get to know them. But wow. Uh, I really, really hope that those of you that are watching this on YouTube have enjoyed it. If you are binging this, head on over to part two. I'll see you over there. Those of you that are watching these as they come out, we'll get them out to you as soon as we possibly can. If you liked this uh, video and you want me to keep doing more of this stuff, a thumbs up on the video and comments down, the blo down below. Increase engagement. Follow me on all the other links. Tell people about these streams. I really hope that my 
analysis in some way is meaningful to you and that you feel like you learned something from this, as I will always remind you, I do not claim to be correct. These are just my perceptions of what's going on based on what I do as a therapist and what I can bring to the table from an educational standpoint. So I invite comments uh, as long as they're not spoilery or backseaty. And I read all of them, even if I don't respond to all of them. Super, super cool to have you all on board for this. And I look forward to catching you in part two. And I will see you over.